I'm going first to read a story called Once a Lady, out of my collection, a bit off the map. Uh, I'm reading this for two reasons. First, because it deals with that so essentially English subject, class, the thing which runs all the way through English literature and indeed through all English life, and which has been a great subject of my own for irony and satire. The title, Once a Lady, comes from a phrase which is very frequently heard on English lips, uh, once a lady, always a lady. And I ask the question in this story, if circumstances are so reduced, uh, is a lady still a lady, and if she is, does it really help her? Also, I choose this story because in England at the moment, it's been decided in the courts whether Lawrence's novel, Lady Chatterley's Lover, shall be allowed to appear in entirety. And in my story, Esther Barrington, uh, a vicar's daughter, has dared all for love and run off with a country labourer. And now we see her many years later. In fact, what happens to Lady Chatterley when the glamour has worn off? The story. Eileen Carter tightened the cord of her Sandy Jaeger dressing gown around her full waist, for the routine of preparing for bed was a lengthy one, and her pink and white striped boys' flannel pyjamas were loose and inclined when not controlled to impede her actions. Habitual though all the preparation was, she went at it doggedly, her heavy face, a rosy cheeked bulldog's, set in childish concentration. First she heated the milk in the little saucepan on the spirit stove in the corner of her bedroom. Then she poured three dessert spoonfuls of whiskey into the milk. She placed the milk with two merry biscuits on her bedside table with her reading glasses, her sleeping pills and the cloud of unknowing. Then she knelt to prayer. Once in bed she kicked the hot bottle to rest at her feet, slowly drank the milk and ate both biscuits while she read from the book. All men will they reprove of their defaults, right as they had cured of their souls. And yet they think that they do not else for God, unless they tell him their defaults that they see. And they say that they be stirred thereto by the fire of charity, and of God's love in their hearts. And truly they lie, for it is with the fire of hell welling in their brains and in their imagination. But the passage seemed inappetite to her this night. She had, of course, been guilty of moral righteousness and censoriousness in the past, Often and often, lonely people, she reflected, are prone to this sin. But at this moment, she only wished to dwell on one person's virtues, to give praise to the one she loved. And this, too, was sin also, to which lonely people were prone. She tried to deflect her mind by reading other passages, but the obtrusive thoughts kept breaking in. She was not unaware that the devil sometimes increased his power by forcing his victims to fight him, but rather in withdrawal lay victory. She therefore put by her book, put off her dressing gown, and taking a small green pill with the last grains of the milk, prepared for sleep. It came quickly. But just before she slept, she saw Esther's dear face smiling at her, and she smiled lovingly in return. Far across the village, over the pond and the pub and the crescent of new council houses, in the big bedroom above the shop, Esther Barrington lay awake beside her husband Jim. Esther was used now to waking suddenly in the night, sometimes from alarming dreams, sometimes just from nothing, but always appallingly and hopelessly awake. Tonight she tried, as so often, to attribute her wakefulness to the screech owl that settled on the telegraph wire above the outside lavatory and watched the chickens in their sleep. She blamed it upon the sudden stirrings of young jackdaws in the roof eaves. She was tempted to wake Jim from his heavy sleep and tell him it was all his fault, for despite his deep sleeping, he constantly turned and muttered. When the despair at being awake became urgent, she thought of getting up and running into Mother's room and telling it was her fault for having become senile and for moaning senselessly in the night. You're not my mother, she thought to shout at her. Just because you stood by Jim and me at the time doesn't mean that we have to support you forever. You must leave. But how could a semi-paralysed old woman of 70 leave? In any case, this hysterical attempt to put the blame on others didn't last long, for her very wakefulness seemed to come from so deep within her that it pushed out everything except consciousness of herself. She could think of nothing, see nothing, feel nothing, but herself awake. She tried desperately to force some issue, some thoughts, or at least some memory, out of this blank softness, 
In the years before, when she'd not been drained by work and futility, she'd been able to imagine and think with will concentration, curiously able for one with only a genteel girl's education. Now memory came only in flashed pictures that jolted shakily before her eyes as from a badly operated magic lantern, trembled there for a moment and then flicked out as though the electricity had failed. As for thoughts, they led nowhere. She heard Mother moaning in the next room and told herself that it was just child's crying with no more meaning than that. And then she set herself to reflect whether indeed a child's crying meant so little, whether its terrors were indeed so transitory. Her mind, however, would make nothing of it. Scenes of her own childhood misery, of the cupboard in the vicarage nursery where she'd taken her sorrows, or of the dank, rotting-leaved ground behind the hibiscus where she'd fled grown-up solicitude, came before her sharply and were as sharply gone. And as then, as though flashed on the local cinema screen, the old, tedious generalities. You have no children. It's worked out badly. Perhaps I'm to blame. I'm to blame. I'm tired of it all. She heard in recollection Lottie Washington's dismal droning next door. Oh, I never felt more like crying all night, for everything's wrong and nothing ain't right. Then, defeated by the fact that all her attempts at thinking had ended only in recollection of a vulgar popular song, she turned to doing sums in her head. After all, her true anxieties were practical. She went over the biscuit orders they'd placed, did the confectionery accounts, and measured the dwindling return from egg sales against the possible returns from homemade jam. But everything always depended on bills and figures that lay downstairs in the sawdusty, soapy-smelling dark of the shop. Past accounts now came into her head, and the large sums that had once spelt the failure of their farming venture became inextricably involved with the little bills of the shop that now kept their heads just above water. She saw herself and Jim swimming in the water-filled shop, their heads bopping up and down like ducks, she thought indignantly, an absurd position for a woman who had once given scandal to her family, a woman who had married beneath her for love, a woman who had stolen another woman's husband. She checked a sudden loud laugh, as she realised to what novelettish terms she had reduced the central action of her life. The laughter turned to bitter sobbing, which in turn she checked. She had no right to add to Jim's already cruelly heavy day by disturbing his sleep. The church clock sounded four. I'm not a bit tired, she said to herself. Sleeplessness is only harmful if you allow yourself to think it so. She knew, however, how tired she would be when the alarm sounded at half past five. And now to calm her came the reflection which increasingly supported her resolution to hold on. It took great courage for someone brought up as I was to do what I did. She hated the snobbish implication of the thought. Nevertheless, she moved away from Jim in the bed, and pride at her reflection gave her calm. She was already behind the counter serving, or rather listening to old Mrs. Sumper, when Jim returned from his milk round. She will lie a little sleeping child as she lay there. Doctor said he'd never seen one go so peaceful, not as had gone with the cancer. Through the old woman's words, Esther saw her husband for a moment as a stranger entering the shop. Swarthily handsome, strong but gentle, a strong, steady face set in heavy lines of patience. People said that she too had kept her prettiness, and as to the lines, they only gave more interest to the face, people said. Well, let them say, that was all right if every line didn't speak of past worries and of back-breaking labours. As to the gentleness and patience, if only she didn't resent them. He ought to be more angry, more resentful, she thought. I've cheated him, and he ought to hate me for it. What does love mean if it breeds only gentleness? She indicated his sandwiches to him, but he only smiled and went upstairs. When he came down again, Mrs. Sumper had finished her story. Well, there it is, she said. You haven't got them, so I'll have to go and get them at Rayner's when I go into Litchfield. She sniffed resentfully and walked out of the shop. Mother's waiting for her breakfast, Jim said. Jim Esther cried. She's had her breakfast. I gave it to her half an hour ago. Ah, the old poor old thing's forgotten then. Well, she really shouldn't have done. I gave her two sardines and she insisted on dipping them into her tea. For some reason, Esther heard herself laugh loudly. Jim's dark calf eyes looked sadly hurt for a moment. Then he said, You've got enough to do without extra burdens. We'll have to send her away. It annoyed her that after fifteen years of married life with her... Peasant fears and ignorance showed through his good sense and independence in phrases like, send her away. She admired him still so much, but it enraged her to think of his humility before authorities like hospitals or doctors. He'd been so meek and uncomplaining three years ago when the failure of the farm had ended in two bouts of pneumonia. 
Don't be silly, Jim. We've discussed all that, she said, and she began bustling about behind the counter, rearranging tins on the shelves. The Maxwell children, a huddle of cheeping underfed sparrows, came into their daily supply of licorice. When they'd gone, she said, You'll be late at Major Driver's, Jim. See if they give you some tea for your lunch. It's a bit windy. She felt ashamed of her solicitude for his health, remembering how he married him for his physical strength. And now it was her wary strength, and he counted her sympathy. I don't like to see you not sleeping, he said. You must speak to the doctor about it. They can give you something on the back of foot. What do you know about my sleeping, she cried with mocking indignation, snoring your head off. She was overcome with tenderness for him and resented it. What could the underlying tenderness do to mend the broken surface of their daily life together? Besides, it's early closing, thank heaven, in Carter. Ah, that'll do you good, he said, smiling. She's still delighted to see him. She knew, however, how little he liked her friendship with Eileen, that ladylike companion of books and gardening and religion in which he had no part. Miss Meadows came in for some elastic, but Jim disregarded her presence. He went up to Esther and whispered, It'd be far better to let the old woman go as the doctor wants. Esther only shook her head in reply. She'd brought him no children to care for. She was not going to let his mother be taken away. She turned away from him towards Miss Meadows, but as she passed him, he pressed the back of his hand against hers and whispered, Thank you, my old Esther. It was a gesture and words he had not used for so long, a gesture which recalled intensely the days of their clandestine love-making, their occasional secret pressures and touches when they met in shop or market or some of recognition impossible in the days before the scandal broke. The tenderness that filled her this time was so little touched by irritation that Miss Meadows, receiving her card of elastic, said, The cold weather agrees with you all right, Mrs. Barrington, but there you're always on the move. Perhaps the reawakened and unalloyed tenderness for Jim would have died beneath the anaesthetic of the day's tedious chores had not a chance customer revived the past in Esther's feelings. For all those years in the remoteness of their York Yorkshire farm, she'd chance contact revived the years of scandal who even at worst might break down the wall which she'd built around Jim's wounded self-esteem. But in these last years, with her father dead and her mother gone to join Rosamond in Kenya, the Sussex faces had faded out in dimness. The thought of their intrusion had ceased office in the shop. Remote though their Midland village was from the south, the chance was far greater, and on that very morning it turned to certainty. Amelia, the voice that asked for cigarettes, made her sure. It was Charles Stanton, still bearing traces of the fourteen-year-old boy who, round-eyed, had once stared at her so fascinatedly as the subject of mysterious adult whispering. Childhood visual memory was apparently less enduring, for he left the shop without recognising her. She peered through the stacked boxes of puffed wheat and tins of cocoa in the window. There, indeed, in the Ford console, sat Mrs. Stanton, motherly, vulgar, overdressed, hardly changed, indeed, from the woman who, with more titillated curiosity than her small sons, had befriended her in those isolated days after the scandal broke. The of the old woman's kindness made Esther start for the door to hail the passing tourists. Then a sharp recollection of how difficult even kindness had been to endure forced her back into the shop's safety. With relief, she heard the car drive off. But that momentary impulse of Charles Stanton to stop the cigarettes, Mrs. Stanton's love of touring with her son, that weariness had interposed between Esther and the worst fortnight of her life. If she had had her way, indeed if her mother's will had prevailed, she would not have stayed one day at the vicarage after Jim's wife had made her seal. But her father had been so determined. If you care for me at all, Esther, you will stay and fight it out. I will try to help you, even to forgive you, as long as you do not run away. I can forgive anything. Indeed, I should hardly be a minister of Christ if I could not, but cards I will not forgive. It had been nothing to do with her, of course. It was part of his relentless fight against the parishioners. I will teach these people Christ's charity, even if I can do so only with the rod of shame. Of course he could not. And at the end of a fortnight, he had been relieved, when she ended his fight for him by running away. Why, indeed, should the parish have forgiven her? She had betrayed her class, her church, and her sex. They had not shared the passion which had sustained and driven her. If she'd been outside that passion, she would have been on their side. Only Mrs. Stanton, my dear, you're always welcome here, I'm sure. Not that that'll help you with the county, I'm afraid. You know what they think of Henry and me. Rich trade, that's us. But who cares what they say? They think the days of carriage folk are still with us, stupid creatures. And then her sentimental curiosity. Well, love certainly suits her, doesn't it, Henry? i never seen you in such good features, my dear. Old Mr. Stanton, too, just a little more familiar than he should have been. 
Esther had hated herself for needing their support, and hated herself too for disliking it. But she couldn't bear their coating her passion with their sickly sentimentalism. You must always follow your heart in life, my dear. She'd longed to reject Mrs. Stanton as Marianne had rejected Mrs. Jennings. But then Marianne had not committed adultery with her Willoughby. Little by little, the memories faded from her mind at the chibbing and poking, the day's demands, the accounts, the customer's gossip, the orders, the telephone. She was left as she closed the shop at one o'clock, only with an overwhelming tenderness for Jim. As tea time approached, Eileen Carter became as excited as a schoolgirl. Although a strict guardian of her conscience, she was not inclined to be conscious of her own moods. To have been so would have seemed to her dangerously near to emotional fudge to escape her notice, and she told herself sharply not to be swoony. Esther Barrett was a good, brave little woman. It was lucky for both of them that they'd broken through the barriers of shyness, but loneliness helped nobody in this world. She was only so pleased that her comfortable sufficiency in life allowed her to brighten a little the drudge-like existence of someone so decent. That was all there was to it. All the rest was fudge. As she passed through the kitchen to the garden, old Madge glowed warmth at her. I'm making some of those griddle cakes Mrs. Barrington loves. It does one good to see her enjoying herself, doesn't it, Miss Eileen? Eileen's usual gruff notes were almost a bark as she answered, All right, Madge, but don't worry me with it. I'm up to my eyes in work. And so she was, she thought, with twenty herbaceous plants to move. The work ought to have been done a week ago. It was, therefore, a vast prospect of buttocks stretching tight, a chocolate and white striped cloth skirt that confronted Esther as she turned into the garden at a quarter to four that afternoon. Heavens above, Eileen, she cried. Surely you're not putting any more plants into that border. Eileen's pink cheeks were scarlet, almost apoplexy point, as she swung her broad shoulders round to face her visitor. I'm only moving these damn floxes, she grunted. Every one's got a hell of a great root. God knows whether they're worth moving. They're probably riddled with bloody earworm. It was a mark of her shyness that she used to Eileen the bad language that she normally only employed to show that she was not an old frump. But surely you can tell. No, I can't, Eileen said emphatically. The damned leaves are all floppy, but that may be due to the summer's drought. You should let Jim come and advise you, Esther said. In her present mood, she rushed to get in her husband's name as soon as possible. Eileen Carter ran her hand through her untidy, greying black bob with impatience. I have some pretensions to being a gardener myself, Esther, she said. Very good one, her friend replied. But poor Jim, poor dear, does know these things professionally. Professional guardianers, in my experience, Eileen said, always make a balls up. Esther's pretty blue eyes flashed angrily for a moment in her thin, lined face. Then she decided that the poor old thing was in one of her moods. Most of them do, of course, she said. Double begonias and calcellarias, they couldn't have more ghastly taste. Her voice, as she spoke, took on the upper middle class drawl she found only recently again in her friendship with Eileen. They talked for a while about gardening, and as they talked, Eileen lost her shy coarseness, and Esther slipped more completely into drawling assurance. Well, Eileen asked, as they sat over china tea, griddle cakes, and homemade quince cheese, and how is the mum, dotty as ever? She habitually referred to the mothers she visited in her family welfare work as the mums. It was a mark of her attitude to Jim that she called old Mrs. Barrington by the same name. Oh, dear, Esther said, poor old thing, her memory gets worse every day. She was such a good, kind person, Eileen, even if she was always a very simple soul. I can't bear to see her in this childish state. I gave her sardines for breakfast, and nothing would stop her dipping them in her tea. Eileen threw back her bulldog head and wheezed with laughter. For a moment, Esther was on the point of joining in when she remembered Jim. It isn't a laughing matter, Eileen, she said. Her handkerchief was rolled into a ball in the palm of her hand. She dug nails into it, with anger at betraying Jim. She should never have spoken of Mother's pathetic childishness. Eileen looked at her unperturbed. Oh, yes, it is, my dear, she said. Sickness, death, even sin all have their absurdities, and God intended that we should laugh at them, as long as it's not cruel laughter. She licked one of her small cheroots, her only capitulation to eccentricity. Jane understood it well enough, as you know. She could laugh at Mrs. Musgrave's fat tears over her scapegoat son, but Emma's cruel jibe at Miss Bates could not be forgiven. It's as simple as that, or rather like everything else in life, as difficult. When she spoke her ethical convictions, her gruff voice became absurdly offhand and flat. Esther took a last piece of currant bread to finish her quince cheese. Jane Austen was awfully clever, she said, but even when I'm enjoying her books most, I sometimes wonder whether she ever knew what it was like to be laughed at. What? Eileen questioned. A surplus old maid? Then, embarrassed by this degree of self-revelation, she added, The trouble with you, my dear, is that you're a Jane Bennett and not an Eliza. You take too good a view of the world. You let it trample over you.
Oh, cried Esther, have I had enough of revolt to last me for my life? I don't ever want to fight people again. I just want to be left alone to get on with my work, and God knows there's enough of it. Then she looked across at Eileen's glowing fire, the samplers, the bellows, the etchings of Litchfield Cathedral. What I'd most like in all the world, she said, stretching her thin body with an easiness unusual for her neat, trim manner, would be some comfort, some ease of living like this. Or rather, she added earnestly, I should like it for Jim. Eileen's heavy face seemed to lose all life to become a smooth, fleshy mess. I can't quite see dear old Jim at this house, she said, with a chuckle that was not somehow warm. Esther still stretched relaxed. Can't you? She spoke from far away. You don't know Jim at all, do you, Eileen? Not very easy to know, Eileen answered stiffly. Isn't that the best kind? Esther asked. Then, as though she'd returned to the room again suddenly, she said in a light, gay voice, Oh, Eileen, you can't think how much it means to be able to come and relax here. You are a dear person, you know. Eileen's heavy head bent down for a moment in girlish shyness. I wish you'd come more often, she said. Oh, my dear, if I could. Esther laughed. But how could I? Who's to give Jim his tea? Eileen got up and stood for a moment by her chair, her thick legs ungainly set apart. Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image, she said. She moved across the room and fingered the dried hydrangeas on the window table. It's awful here on rainy days, she said absently. Then coming behind Esther, she placed a square hand on her shoulder and pressed it. The gesture of intimacy was familiar to her friend. You're worth such a lot more than you think, Eileen said. Then she stroked Esther's greying fair hair. It was a gesture entirely unfamiliar to her friend, and she got up hurriedly, pushing Eileen's hand to one side. She went over to the mirror above the fireplace and parted her hair into place. Eileen sat down on the sofa, legs apart, heavy bosom forward, squat and lowering. Esther stared into the mirror and spoke without turning round. I suppose I've lost the art of friendship, she said. You've no idea what it's like to be a lawbreaker in decent society. And that's what Jim and I wear. We broke every rule in the book. I pray for forgiveness, and God, I trust, will forgive me. But the world, especially the village world, isn't God. Eileen laughed. Oh, you make it sound like one of those novels I used to read as a girl. My dear, times have changed. Why, no, Esther still did not look at her friend, but the county haven't. About adultery, perhaps, but they don't forgive anyone who oversteps their precious class barrier. You live in the past, Eileen declared. A gleam appeared in her usually dulled eyes. Besides, even if you're right, it isn't as noticeable as all that. You've acquired a good deal of protective colouring through the years, you know. Esther swung round. For a moment, her soft blue eyes showed horror. Oh, my dear, Eileen boomed. I've said the wrong thing. If that's what worries you, put your mind at rest. Once a lady, as our mums used to say. Once a lady, always a lady, for what it's worth. I'm going to read some extracts from my novels. I've chosen extracts which represent various clashes, uh, almost, I would say, representations of infernos in the modern world. The first of these is from Hemlock and After. In this novel, the humanist uh, writer, Bernard Sands, at the culmination of his well-known career, uh, buys, or persuades the nation to buy, Varden Hall, a large country house, to be used as a home for young writers. And at the opening of this uh, house by him, he makes a speech which is very defeatist and disastrous, and all the characters are brought together in a terrible clash of uh, wills and also in that kind of loneliness, that kind of impossibility of communication, which I believe to be the mark of the modern world. So that most of the characters of the book appear in this novel, including the sinister procuress, Mrs. Curry, who had wanted to buy the house Barden Hall for a hotel for very different purposes. Eric realised suddenly that the future frightened him. All of it. With or without Bernard's help, with or without being Lorenzo's page or the young Lord Varden. As though to point the moral, Ron, in his best dark grey suit, pale peach shirt and silver tie, came across the lawn towards them. Hello, he said. I wondered if I'd see you here, seeing as you were such a good friend of Mr. Sands. This is Ron, said Eric. I never told you, Bernie, about meeting him at St Albans. No, said Bernard. You didn't. He told me he lived at Varden, and I told him that I knew you. Yes, said Bernard. I see that you did. Well, it's gone all right so far, hasn't it, Mr. Sand, said Ron. Yes, said Bernard. It's nearly over now. Ron fiddled with his belt and moved from one leg to another, but neither Bernard nor Eric spoke. 
You're lucky to have a pal like Mr. Sands, Ron said. I haven't got a pal. I remember, said Eric. You been to St. Albans again, asked Ron. No, said Eric. You never been to see the Abbey when you'd come special to see, not after you met me, did you? Ron winked. You work for Mrs. Curry, don't you? asked Bernard. Don't hold that against me, said Ron. I'd like to work for a man, really. He was sweating with the effort of getting his point across. As no one answered, he peered at Eric's tie. You like bright colours, don't you, he said. He looks all right in them too, don't he? It seemed inconceivable that Mrs. Curry's huge form could have been hidden behind a rather small azalea bush. But nevertheless, she appeared so suddenly that Bernard got that rather unpleasant impression. Good afternoon, Mr. Sands, she said. I didn't know you knew Mr. Sands, Ron. Oh, this is his pal, what I told you about, what I met in St. Albans. How do you do, said Mrs. Curry. You write poetry, don't you, dear? Love lyrics, I expect. No, said Eric, I work in a bookshop. Selling Mr. Sands books, eh? Mrs. Curry smiled. Quite a labour of love. Well, Mr. Sands, she went on, so we know one poet at least will make use of the new Varden Hall. Very nice, too. I should have been so glad to have had you as a guest here, if I'd been able to run the hotel, sitting about writing your love poems, and Mr. Sands coming up to see you whenever he wanted. You've got it wrong again, said Bernard, smiling. As Eric already said, he doesn't write poetry. I expect it's because he looks so poetical, said Mrs. Curry, like Lord Alfred Douglas. You go a long way back for your parallel, said Bernard. One can see, I'm afraid, that you're not on your usual ground. You dress like a poet anyway, dear, said Mrs. Curry to Eric. You like a little bit of colour, don't you? I expect you like a bit of something else too, although you look such a quiet boy. But then they often go together, don't they, Mr. Sands? Eric's giggle broke the tension. What a funny thing to say, he said. I shouldn't ever call you delicate, just because you're wearing such a delicate shade of mauve. Mrs. Curry gave her brutal laugh. You've got the ready answer ready, haven't you, she said. We'll all have to see more of each other, I can see. Thank you, said Eric, but I'm afraid I must go now to find my mother. I left her at the tea tent, talking to an extraordinary old woman with cropped hair. I'm sure she was tiddly, only of course Mimi never notices things like that. Christ, said Ron, that sounds like my mother. You've been giving her something to drink, he said to Mrs. Curry. She seems so tired, poor old dear, said Mrs. Curry. I gave her a bottle of whiskey to keep her on her feet. Well, she won't be on them long, said Ron. Nice sort of night I'm going to have. I'll help you to put her to bed, said Mrs. Curry. I'll come along with you now, dear, she told Eric, and see how she is. As the squat mauve figure walked off with her chin pressed close to Eric's shoulder, they reminded Bernard of Alice and the Duchess. It's love, he thought, that makes the world go round. You haven't got no special pal in Varden, have you, said Ron? I haven't any pals in Varden, Bernard replied. No, said Ron. Mrs. Curry don't like you. I'm sorry for that, Bernard answered. If I was your pal, I could tell you lots of things about her, what would make it easy for you to deal with her. I doubt if I shall have to deal with Mrs. Curry, said Bernard. Of course, I wouldn't meet you in the village, said Ron, who was sexing with his eyes to an almost painful degree. But I might see you in Bentham. I shouldn't think so, said Bernard. I hardly ever go there. Your brother-in-law's got improper with Mrs. Curry. He better know how to look after himself. When Bernard didn't reply, Ron said archly, I don't seem to appeal to you. No, said Bernard, I think we might bring the conversation to an end. He walked across the drive where the last motor cars were making their departure. As he crossed the lawn, he was met by a drunken Sherman with his band of friends. You old horror, Sherman said, waving his hand towards the direction of Ron, always getting what everyone's after. But still, we mustn't be grouchy, after all, it is your big day. Sherman's friends were too awed by Bernard to do more than sway lightly, but peals of giggles came to him after he'd left them. My second extract is from my novel, The Middle Age of Mrs. Elliot, and the inferno here is, to my mind, uh, one of the worst hells of the modern world, worse almost than a party, an international airport, the f where the uh, individual feels suddenly that his whole personality is taken from him, both in space and in time. And it's very important in Mrs. Elliot's life, because during the scene which I shall read, her husband is accidentally shot in a political assassination in an Eastern Asiatic airport, and she, in fact, loses her, the love of her life, her personality, and uh, her money. And so this is a representative scene of another kind of hell.
Almost immediately their flight number was called. Will passengers in transit proceed first to the barrier, please? Passengers in transit first, please. That was their call. Meg hastened to move before Bill could call her back. He was inclined to fuss unnecessarily about airplane and train times. As she left Bill, she noticed that the eminent personage, followed only by the fat young secretary, had moved straight towards the restaurant exit without regard for any precedence of passengers in transit. And Bill had stood aside for him. His admiration for the man would almost certainly have been increased by this disregard for official instructions. Such complete certainty somehow always increased Bill's admiration for people out of all proportion. As she reached the entrance to the ladies, Bill's voice sounded, calling her back. She turned for a second and signalled that there was no need to fuss. The party of earnest young men she noticed had broken up. The shirt-sleeved customs official had run up to the eminent personage's secretary and engaged him in some lengthy explanation. They were gesticulating wildly. The eminent personage stood alone at the door, his back turned to all the fuss. Bill, nearby, looked ominously impatient. She opened the door of the ladies, violently, to show that she was hurrying. The place was as dirty as Bill had predicted. The humidity, heavy enough outside, seemed to seep from the pores of the cracked, whitewashed walls as in some underground grotto. Up above, where the ceiling cast shadows, lizards, inert and intent, lay flattened against the moist wall surface. The single tap of the water basin had a loose washer. As she turned it on, there was a grumbling and groaning, and then almost immediately came the high clip a die voice in its American English accent, calling the final notice of their flight. Startled into eager haste, she turned to the handbag that she'd placed on a wooden ledge to find her cologne-soaked tissue pads. In too eager haste, for the bag fell from the ledge, scattering its contents in all the dark, squalid corners beneath the basin. She could not see, and to the touch of her finger ends, numb by the intense humidity, she might have been scrabbling among spiders instead of handkerchiefs and tissues. Everything seemed soft to her deadened senses. She felt hysteria mounting, then happily her lipstick holder gleamed in the darkness. Methodically, she found each object, washed or dusted it, and replaced it in her bag. Then quickly but deliberately, she cleaned her face with the tissue pads, peered into the dirty looking glass, redid her mouth. Even the lizard, suddenly darting across the wall in pursuit of a fly, could not disturb her now. She was freshened, ready to see things in perspective, yet not evading her sense that a crisis in their lives had come upon her unawares and that she must deal with it. She was not, as Bill had put it, rattled. Above the loud noise of aeroplane propellers, she thought for a moment that she could hear him calling to her, and noted how frayed his nerves must be that his impatience could so outweigh his sense of decorum. She heard cries and shouts, and hoped that Singapore would not be too noisy. She prepared her phrase to meet Bill's impatience. Well, I'm late, darling, but not too late, so I don't intend to apologise. She swung open the door and walked almost into the arms of the air stewardess, Miss Vines. The stewardess pushed her back through the door into the ill-lit cellar-like room. Even in the gloom, her eyes looked out from her rather stupid, regulation-made-up face with a parodied solemnity that hardly concealed her feverish excitement. Mrs. Elliot, she said, I don't think you should go back into the restaurant yet. There's something I have to tell you. Mick's first thought was that she was confronted by a lunatic. She'd felt in the plane that the girl was neurotic and unsatisfied. Horrors lay so very little below the awful dead monotony of the suburban mind. Then she knew. It's Bill, she said, is ill. Miss Vines tried hard to reach some communication of individual compassion, but it was so difficult. There were so many passengers in her life. She put her hand on Meg's arm, but it was shaken off. Don't be absurd, you silly girl, Meg said. I must go out to him. When Miss Vines did speak, she sounded as though she were delivering the key line in a play. He's very ill, I'm afraid. He's been shot. The strangeness hardly reached Meg at that moment. She thought only, she's using the conventional words to tell me that he's dead. She followed Miss Vines out into the restaurant with a slow, numbed walk. The chattering, excited crowd divided at Miss Vine's word to let them pass through. She saw, in a blur out of the corner of her eye, the pale student being dragged away by two uniformed men. He was without his glasses. Blood was pouring from where his nose was smashed, flatter than ever, against his amber cheeks. Meg had a sudden vision of the whole scene as part of some film. This must be how it was on the sets. For a moment she felt a violent anger against them all for making a cardboard scene out of Bill's life and her own. But then the unimportance of anything overcame her so completely. She thought, now I'm supposed for some reason to act with dignity, since there's no point in any action anymore. <laughs>
A second later, she saw Bill's face, chalk white, and saw his blue lips moving. She turned on Miss Vines, almost as though she would strike her. You told me he was dead, she cried. These precious seconds when Bill needed her, wasted by this wicked girl's stupidity. She knelt on the tiled floor by Bill's head. Darling, she said, can you see me? It'll be all right, it'll be all right. And as though to echo her, Bill's voice came very slowly, and in a whisper she could hardly hear. We'll keep going, he said. But his eyes seemed quite dull and staring. Her body trembled in a convulsive effort to restrain any tears or cry. A woman's voice came behind her and said, A la pauvre dame. And then a tall man was bending over Bill, cutting away his shirt and trousers from his stomach, holding Bill's hand, stroking his arm. Meg looked up. Are you the doctor? she asked. Why don't these fools get a doctor? Je suis médecin, madame, the tall man said. He had a purple birthmark on his neck. Calmez-vous. Votre mari ne souffre pas beaucoup. Il a subi un très grave choc. Were they all mad suddenly that they'd begun to talk to her in French? Je vais lui faire une piqûre de morphine, the tall man said, and rolling up Bill's sleeve, he plunged the needle into the crook of his arm. Bill's face, so flabby now in its paper whiteness, twitched for a second. The tall man stood up. Il ne faut pas donc pas faire trop grande attention à ce qu'il dira, he said. Meg strove to give meaning to his words. Perhaps he was telling her that Bill would be out of his mind. Well, if so, she would make a life for him somehow, anything so long as he still had a life to make. Always these foreground actors playing some absurd role. And out of the line of Meg's vision, this crouched absurd extras, dressed as Chinese, Badai, Americans, Indian, and God knows what. She would not allow them to obtrude upon the reality of herself and Bill. My last extract is from my novel Anglo-Saxon Attitudes. Here we have a family horror. Families in my novel stand for rather terrible, uh, involved relationships which somehow at the same time uh, are detached. And in this book, Gerald Middleton is looking back over his life to the points where things have gone wrong. And he remembers the time when his marriage with, his, with Inge, uh, a Danish woman, first uh, failed, and he took a mistress called Dolly, and he and his wife tried, in the modern manner of the 1920s, to accept the mistress and all to be friends and for the children to know her as Aunt Dolly, a disastrous and unreal attempt at being uh, honest. And in this scene, we have the birthday party of one of the children. They're being taken to a restaurant in London, and there, at another table, sits the mistress, who has obviously followed Gerald, and who is drunk. The children were now happily settled on the long red velvet sofa at the Café Royal. And so Robin is a big man now, and he chooses smoked salmon, said Ingeborg. Do you think he will like that? It is only red fish, you know, with lemon. But when Robin solemnly reasserted his choice, she said to the waiter with mock seriousness, The gentleman wants a good portion of smoked salmon. And what will you have, Kate? It's your birthday. You choose what you like. Gerald looked at his leggy daughter with affection, but Kay looked at her mother. What shall I have, Mummy? she asked. Oh, you mustn't ask me. Ask Papa, who is giving this lovely birthday to a lucky little girl. Kay looked at her father obediently. It annoyed Gerald that she apparently had no views of her own. After all, she was thirteen but he guessed the agony that the spotlight was causing her and thought it better to order for her. Lobster Termidor, he said to the waiter. There you are, madam, he said, hating himself for the facetiousness which he couldn't avoid with his children. The lobster is being boiled at your command. Kay became very red in the face. Oh, Gerald, my dear, what have you said, cried Inge. She will never eat it now, poor little Kay. You don't want the lobster to be cooked for you, do you, dear? Then she whispered fussily to the waiter. I've ordered her some fried sole, she said to Gerald. Case turned red instead of the lobster, Robin declared with glee. Shut up, said Gerald. Poor Robin, cried Inge. You were only teasing, weren't you? You mustn't tease your sister on her birthday, you know. But even so, Kay, you mustn't cry just because your brother makes a joke, she added to her daughter, who was now in tears. John was waving across the room and smiling with all the charm he already put over at twelve years old. There's Auntie Dolly, he cried. Why doesn't she come over? Gerald's heart sank. Any other interruption but this would have been heaven sent. I expect she's dining with someone else, he said, without looking round. She isn't dining, John replied. She's sitting at one of those long marble top tables, drinking, all by...
She's talking to herself, he said. She oughtn't to do that, ought she, thingy? People will think she's potty. The French mistress in the form I was in last term talks to herself, Kay announced. We all laugh at her. Gerald shot her a look of gratitude for the child's tact in changing the conversation. But it was clear that it was a childish rather than a tactful remark, for she added, Let's all laugh at Auntie Dolly. Good idea, cried John. They both laughed loudly. Ha, ha, ha. Gerald cried Inky in queen tones. Go and ask Dolly to have a liqueur with us. Somebody has said some silly thing, and now she's shy to speak to me. She looks very unhappy, she whispered, as though Gerald's failure to make Dolly happy was directly answerable to her. I don't think that's necessary, he said. She'll come over if she wants to. But it was too late. The Kay, anxious to please her mother, asked, Shall I go and ask her, Mummy? After all, it's my birthday party. In the end, Gerald accompanied his daughter across the great dining room. Good evening, Kay, said Dolly, trying to bring her fuddled senses to cope with the situation. Her mind reeled round until the centre of everything seemed to be in her mouth. This she contorted into what she hoped was a suitable smile. It's my birthday dinner, said Kay. I came to invite you. Auntie Dolly was not very well, and she put all the sweetness into her little speech that the English mistress had taught her in last term's production of Mary Rose. The stilted little elocutionary voice only made Dolly giggle. She was acutely aware that she could not trust herself to walk happily across the room. Thank you, she said. I, I, I can't come. Then she stopped dead, for she could think of no reason to give. Gerald desperately announced, Auntie Dolly's waiting for someone. Dolly smiled at him gratefully. Then she sought for something to say to Kay, something funny. You shouldn't wear a hat like a jerry on your birthday, she said. Every sense in Kay was outraged. To talk of vulgar things like that in public, to make fun of her clothes, to make fun of the school hat. It's our school hat, she said. Then red in the face, she walked back to their table. Oh, my God, said Gerald, whatever made you say that? She's a silly little tyke, said Dolly. She needs a good what for on her behind. I say, I'm most awfully sorry, Jerry. She looked at him earnestly. Yes, my dear, I'm sure you are. Shall I get you a taxi, he asked. The scene he dreaded, however, was not to be avoided. Tears began to roll down Dolly's cheeks. You're not to leave me, Jerry, she said. You, you must take me home. I can't, Dolly, really I can't. You had no right to come here. You knew I was giving Kay her birthday dinner. I tried not to, said Dolly. She got to that stage in their relationship when she felt that she must force her prior claim upon Gerald's love, and she knew that by doing so she risked losing it altogether. Either seemed better than accepting terms from him. Yet as soon as she took any action she regretted it. I, I meant to have an evening at home with a book, and she pictured with longing a series of evenings spent at home with books. Anything would be wonderful that excluded all this, that excluded in fact Gerald. But as soon as her mind reached this point her emotions revolted. You had no right to leave me this evening, she said. You know I was in the state. You ought to have stayed with me. You promised me that you'd go up with Pamela if you felt like this, said Gerald. It was all fixed. I'm not one of your bloody children to be sent out and told to behave. Dolly raised her voice. Gerald sat down on the bench beside her. He took her hand. Look, he said, you've got to understand. Some things you've got to put up with, and this is one of them. Kay gets very little out of life. You're entirely selfish. One of his growing frequent fits of revulsion from her possessed him. It's bad enough that I should have lost all real contact with the children. I refuse to be entirely cut off from them because of your lack of self-control. The lesser things have to be sacrificed to the greater. He spoke with deliberate cruelty. He only did so when, as now, Dolly was too far gone to respond to cold water shock, however. She looked at him with a face that was trembling. It's no good, she said, you're talking because you're going to take me home. Very well, said Gerald, but I'm not staying at the flat. You realise that? Dolly knew as well as he, but she had won. She said, of course, this isn't really a scene, you know. They got to the stage where scenes were to be counted against her in a list. It's only because I'm drunk. But they had reckoned without Ingeborg. Before he could make his way to the family table to explain his departure, she had borne down upon them. You must go back to the children, Gerald. I will take Dolly back to her flat. Jerry's taking me home, said Dolly, in petulant assertion, but she was no longer shouting. No, said Ingy in her soothing voice. Gerald is giving Kay her birthday dinner. I will take you home, Dolly. And she began to slip Dolly's coat on her. Gerald, seeing Dolly's sudden acquiescence, held back his objections. What on earth are the children? Ingy answered his unfinished question. I have told them that Dolly's drunk, she said. Was that necessary? Gerald asked angrily. Yes, Gerald, it was. They must be told the truth. Besides, she added, they must know the reason why they will not see her any more. She turned to Dolly. You see, Dolly, what comes of behaving like a little child? You frightened my little Kay, and I cannot help that. 
so you will not come to see them and they will not visit you. So this, thought Gerald, is where Inge wriggles out of the position her muddled ethics have got her into. But looking at his wife, he saw that her big blue eyes were sincerely full of tragic compassion for Dolly's deprivation. More surprising to him still, however, was Dolly's reaction. She took Inge's arm, and with a tearful voice, Please take me home, Inge, she said. As they left the restaurant, a huge and a tiny figure, each in the fashionable black cloth coats with fur at shoulder and cuffs. They didn't seem the two women with whom he was most intimate, but rather two repellent black shapes from a nightmare. <laughs>